Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Multispeed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. It's 1-855-450-6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalaya. I am your host, delighted to be here with you as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off this hour. Joining me, as always, Steve Ovens. Welcome to the program, sir. Hey, Noah. How's your night going? Hey, you know what? So far, so good. So I want to kick off uh, this episode with a call from James from Idaho. Hey, James, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hey, Noah. Um, this is a software-hardware combo. Um, I'm been murdering my fair share of laptops. So I've given up on that idea. I need a portable computer. I'm thinking maybe the Pi might handle it. But the video requirements are occasional, occasional YouTube at 720, maybe 480, flopping between full screen and and window for when I'm forgotten how to do something and I'm quickly looking up um, uh, how to do something, with, you know, for the Linux. Well, I, I, I would start here, James. So I would tell you that in a lot of circumstances, in fact, I just came across a Reddit post that was that was talking, that was having kind of this discussion, and it was a gentleman who said, you know, I'm a software developer, and so I spend a lot of my time in Vim and VI, and I do a lot of web browsing, have some music going in the background. Every once in a while, I play a 1080p uh, video, and I'm starting to think to myself, self. Do I really need a 700 watt power supply and a $450 graphics card and a huge uh, tower computer to be able to do what I do? And I think maybe I could get away with just a microcomputer. And many of the replies that that gentleman got back were, have you thought about using something like a Raspberry Pi? A decked out Raspberry Pi is actually going to give you a reasonable amount of performance to do a lot of those things. And so I think that's uh, definitely a direction you could start out and see if that works for you. Uh, what I would tell you as it relates to switching back to Windows when you get yourself into some trouble is I don't think you're going to get the best support um, for Windows on a Raspberry Pi. Not to say that it can't be done. I, my understanding is that they have images of Windows 10 out there, but it probably wouldn't be my first choice. I think if I were you, what I would consider doing is looking at something like a really good Intel Nook. Uh, like something like the Skull Canyon, if you were willing to purchase that used, you'd probably get a pretty decent price on it. That would give you both the stability and, ab and ability to run Linux completely uncumbered and switch back to Windows back and forth when you need to. Steve, what are your thoughts? I think that's an interesting idea. I I would be curious to find out whether putting Windows in a VM would be reasonable obviously not on the pie because there's going to be a lot of challenges and overhead with that but if you ended up with going with the NUC or you know one of the other brands like from gigabyte or something like that should have enough horsepower to have a vm that you could power on that you wouldn't have to uh dual boot with if you didn't want to have you thought about running a vm james well you got one thing a little bit off when i mean switching windows mode to full mode in Linux, I needed to know if something like the Pi 4 could handle the video without going, aren't good at. <laughs> okay. Because I haven't looked at I haven't looked at the Pi in on, since Pi 1, <laughs> and uh, that was like so underpowered. It was like okay. <laughs> And why I don't want to do any more laptops is I have a tendency to get 15-year-old laptops and then murder them. I mean, the only thing useful anymore is the screen, which I can't use for anything. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if the Pi 4 would have enough oomph to do 720 video occasionally, ping-ponging when I, we have to go for full screen because, you know, watching someone show you how to... Um, do something, and they put it in the smallest font possible, and you're like, I need to go full screen so I can see that. <laughs> yeah. No, I think you'd easily be able to... Got. 
I think you'd easily be able to do 720p video, James, inside of a Raspberry Pi 4. In fact, I have run Kodi with 4K video on a Raspberry Pi 4, and it's not a perfect experience, but it, it's almost there. And so 1080p and below, I, I think you're pretty set. Steve, any follow-up thoughts? Uh, 720p hasn't been an issue uh, on the Pi 4 that I have. I have the 4 gig model. So I'd say give it a shot, although the caveat there is that it's heavily reliant on like video offloading to the to the video card. So you could get into a situation where you're playing a video that just can't cut it because there is no video decoding, like hardware decoding, and then it chokes. Absolutely. So I guess give those a try, James. And and as always, please give me a call back. Let me know how it works out. I would love to know. In fact, I would say I can count on one hand the amount of people that I know that run uh, a Raspberry Pi as their daily driver. So I'd really be interested in hearing that. Again, open phones, 855-450. No, it's one 855 The email live at asknoahshow.com. Our first email comes in from Dalton. Dalton writes in and says, Hey Noah, recent discussion of data destruction of solid state media in the Ask Noah Show reminded me of a recent undertaking of mine. It's called Boomstick. And he gives a, a link to Boomstick. It is boomstick. Excuse me, gitlab.com slash universal superbox slash boomstick. Uh, boomstick is a self contained automatic or semi automatic, depending on the target hardware, USB stick that destroys data using any method supported by the storage device's firmware. So you'll recall in a previous week's episode, we were talking about um, destroy, uh, you know, using, you know, wipe or shred to be able to remove information from an SSD. And somebody wrote in and said, hey, you know, that doesn't work. And of course, what they're referring to is, that the wear leveling will prevent the disk from actually performing what you've asked it to do. And so my response to that, or my suggestion back was use the built in secure erase functionality that's built into the drive. And so what Dalton has done is designed a software stack that runs basically on a little USB stick. And then it accesses the ATA secure erase functionality or the ATA sanitizer or, uh, or, uh, or secure trim. And then passes several bits of random data over the disk, depending on what the firmware supports. And uh, he writes in and says, of course that has the limitation that you're trusting the drive's firmware to really erase the disk when these commands are sent to it. But for the customer that I was working on for this, it was perfectly acceptable. If such a thing seems interesting to you or your audience, I could spend a bit more time documenting it and getting builds together. The whole thing is really just a wrapper that exists around a script. He gives a link again, gitlab.com slash universal superbox slash boomstick. He says, which can be run basically on any Linux device. It could still use quite a bit of work, especially in the documentation. So maybe you could send your audience over there and let me know what they think. And I've been chatting a little bit um, with Dalton about this because, I, like I said, I, I think this is pretty cool. And he said, you know, this is really great. We'll see if anybody bites on it. If anybody's interested, though, well, you know, it's right now it just doesn't have any documentation. Documentation. He also says it works on hard disks as well, not just SSDs. So you'll want to check out Boomstick. It might be a potentially really great way for you to, um, to, to get in there and erase drives. And again, I'll reiterate what was discussed on that previous episode as well as what somebody wrote into the show. If you don't want to have to think about this or worry about this, and I'm one of those people, I don't trust solid state media. Because at the end of the day, you are trusting closed source firmware and its instructions to the disk also, you're trusting that the disk is writing the data where it is telling you it's writing the data and not to some other area of the disk that, that isn't going to be erased. So if you really want to be secure about it, just use Lux. Just encrypt the whole darn thing and put all of your stuff inside of Lux. Then you're trusting Lux and you're not necessarily trusting the drive. That would be my suggestion to you. But thanks, Dalton. We appreciate you writing in. Charlie writes in and says, G'day, all. I came across this useful tool if anyone has to fix a Windows 10 or 11 in your job or life or helping family or friends. Windows 10, <laughs> he calls it the Windows 10 decrap script, and it removes the crap or bloatware or unwanted stuff. And so the Windows Decrapifier script is github.com slash n1snt, Windows Decrapifier. And then there's an article on Windows to crap a fire at makeuseof.com. We'll have both of those linked to the show notes, podcast.asnoahshow.com. Charlie continues, in the past, I've used Nlight with Windows XP and Windows 2000. From my experience, using computers from 1988 to 
2021, Windows Best of OS was Windows 2000 Pro, and it all went downhill after that. Also, Portable Apps website is useful for techs and people who still need to use Windows, and it's similar to AppImage, and he links to portableapps.com. Thanks, Charlie. And so back when I was in college, I was a huge user of portableapps.com. That was, that was the way I got all my stuff running on the school computers that I wasn't allowed to install anything on. And thanks for the decrapifier script. I was not familiar with that, um, but we'll certainly have it. And I'll check it out. And I come across quite a few Windows boxes that need a swift kick in the rear. Um, Baku writes in and says, hi there, Noah and Steve on episode 250. There was a fascinating listen as always. Do I even have to say that for those who are looking at an alternative to proton mail or WhatsApp? I have a couple of suggestions. C Templar is an alternative for proton mail. It's based out of Iceland, a country with perhaps the most stringent privacy laws in the world. Below are a few related links to C Templar for anyone interested. He links to C Templar about features, privacy, and the terms. Then he talks about Session. Session is an end-to-end -end and decentralized messaging app that could be an alternative for WhatsApp. It has a desktop and mobile app for all of the major operating systems, GNU Linux included. Links for those interested are, and then getsession.org, the FAQs, the white paper, and the download. I didn't go through the features of C Templar and the sessions as that might have sounded like a sales pitch. I'm not associated with either of them. I'm just a satisfied user of both these products. I'm a firm believer in the imagine there is no country philosophy, but my curiosity is getting the better of me. This is the sort of personal question, so please feel free not to answer it. I've known a few people with the surname Chalaya and all of them are from the southern region of India. So do you happen to know or do you happen to have any Indian connection? I'm from India, by the way. And yeah, I, I, yes, I do. My, so my dad immigrated here, uh, from India. He immigrated here from Bangalore. He was, he was born and raised in Bangalore. My grandpa, uh, was a church planter in, in Bangalore. And so he came over here to the United States early eighties and did his residency here in the U S and then started the head of cardiology in North Dakota, where he met my mom, who was a nurse. And here I came to be in North Dakota. So yeah, I have a direct connection to Indian and uh, absolutely love the heck out of Indian food. Still have a couple of relatives that are over in India. And I've not been over there to visit. But they have certainly been over here to visit. And so I've had an opportunity to catch up and kind of learn a little bit about uh, your country, my heritage country. And so, yeah, it's, it's been fantastic. But yes, the surname Chalaya is Indian. Um, comes from Bangalore. And so anyway, so Biku says, thank, and again, thanks for the show. Keep up the great work. Our fourth email comes in from Chaz. Chaz writes in and says, Hey Noah, in the spirit of owning my own data, I purchased a Synology disk station to host Docker containers for Nextcloud, SyncThing, WireGuard, etc. I'm holding my own with the configurations, but there are some things that stump me with how to optimize my setup. So for example, adding Nextcloud trusted domains, using reverse proxies to force HTTPS, setting up WireGuard in general. I don't want to call it and waste the time of people who need your help if you haven't done a whole lot of messing with Docker and Synology. How's your expertise with it? Chaz from upstate New York. So uh, I, before I dig into this, Steve, I want to get your thoughts. Um, I have some global thoughts as to why, when you're going to set up and say, hey, I'm going to set up Nextcloud and sync thing in WireGuard, and I want to do all these things, and I want to have Nginx and reverse proxies and all of those kinds of things. To me, there is a global approach of, well, I don't know that I would choose a Synology disk station to do those because you're playing in Synology's playground. And if I was going to set up all of those individual things, I'd kind of want the freedom to take all of those and let them live to their potential. But before I, before we devolve into that, um, do you have any thoughts for Chaz and what he's trying to accomplish with Docker containers in Synology? I think it's an interesting choice. Um, I, I was looking at the, the list of things that he wants to do, and it should be fine as long as he's not taxing it by having other people on it. You remember, like, the NAS products have a lesser CPU in them on purpose in order to give enough power to, to handle your disk needs, but not drain more power than it needs to. And so because of that, they're not necessarily always ideal for hosting things that you're going to put uh, a bunch of work into. So for example, I wouldn't put something that was really intensive, like uh, a database, for example, if you're going to run Influx, I wouldn't put that probably on my my NAS. Um, 
on a Synology NAS like that. I think it's I think it's a laudable goal to try and bring this stuff in house. Uh, I think that uh, you'll have a lot of fun trying to get it up and and working. And I think that you might have some problems with WireGuard because because of what it tries to do and the way container networking works. Um, but I'd be interesting to interested to see. I'm sure that someone has a guide out there somewhere for how this works, but I'm not sure what kind of underlying security um, functions the, the NAS has. So, for example, if this was a RHEL based, you'd have SE Linux. If it's a Debian based, you could have App Armor. And with those things installed and enforcing, you might have problems with WireGuard because it's trying to do things that a container shouldn't do. Yeah, I so I want to start here. I love Synology stuff. I love their products. Uh, we use them all the time in production. I don't use them for a NAS because I would rather have a ZFS uh, file system if I'm going to if I really need to know that I'm going to to store data. Where I have found Synology to be fantastic is in things like uh, their their surveillance station, and allows me to have what I consider to be an excellent UI and interface for security cameras, all self-hosted, no subscription fee, no cloud, all of the things. And it works very well in that regard. I have played enough with some of the other functionalities of the Synology to see that they have that same level of detail baked into some of their other, other products. And so, for example, one of the things that they're able to do is with their photo syncing app, you can store your photos on the Synology, install the app on your phone, and it is marvelous the way that it works. The problem with it is, and the reason that I've not recommended it to anybody, and the reason that I don't use it personally is because that is a function of Synology. And the second that they decide that they don't want to support it, then that goes away. And so in the case of cameras, really the the massive expensive part or the the getting everything up and running is in the two, 300 cameras that are in a facility. The NVR that brings all those feeds in and puts them out to a nice app well, that's one component. And if I swap out that one component, all the other cameras stay exactly where they are and all and, and continue to work and they can really work with any NVR. So I don't worry about it in that regard. If I were trying to get myself off of Google, I think Synology Disk Station would be a fine place to start, certainly for something like cameras. It would be a fine place to start if you wanted a place to store a bunch of data. I think as I started getting into NextCloud and SyncThing and WireGuard, um, I might consider purchasing a dedicated server to run those things, even if you run them as Docker containers, uh, and then have a dedicated Docker host. Um, and that will then open you up to use the full flexibility of Linux to be able to get everything you'd want to get out of those individual software packages. Our fifth email comes in from Anthony. Anthony writes in and says, hey, you know what? Huge fan of the show. First time emailer. I'm looking to set up a home LAN-based chat server where I can chat with people regardless of their device and where they are. I'd like to use TailScale to be able to chat no matter where they are as well. My daughter loves to message me using her VTech kid Android phone, and I personally don't like using their kid-friendly chat service due to privacy, so I'm looking to replace that with something in-house. I need some <laughs> chat room has figured out where I'm going with this. I need something the user friendly and possibly fun to use emojis, stickers, memes. If it could be something where a user wouldn't need to create an account, that would be an added bonus. Video and voice chat would also be a bonus. I briefly looked at hosting a matrix server, but there seems to be some hurdles due to needing public DNS. Your expertise is greatly appreciated. And just to add, I'll be using ES ESXi as my hypervisor. Thanks, Anthony. So, uh, chat room uh, jumps in and says matrix and that's exactly where where my mind goes anytime we talk about chat hosting but specifically self-host and chat now the dns thing that you came across um does exist but only under uh, certain circumstances so if you're setting up uh synapse which is so L, so matrix is the ecosystem synapse is the server element is the client so I'm going to use proper terminology here, but so I don't confuse you. We're all talking about Matrix, but the server portion of Matrix, Synapse, most popular server out there, Synapse, and setting up Synapse just to be able to send and receive messages does not require public DNS, does not require an SSL certificate. Um, and so you can have Synapse up and running in literally minutes, seconds probably. 
indeed, when I was first playing with Matrix, I so when one of the thing in order for Matrix to actually securely be able to handle communications for a given domain, obviously we can only generate one certificate for the domain. One, you get one, and once that certificate is generated for a given domain. So let's take linuxdelta.com. We've generated a certificate for it. I have that certificate. And so our server is the only server that can ever send messages from the Linux Delta domain, and that's cryptographically secure. So that means if in 10 years I sell the domain linuxdelta.com and that person goes, well, I'm going to put up a matrix server. Actually, you're not. Uh, you're going to, well, at least not for the parent domain, you're going to have to come up with a new subdomain to issue a certificate for because... Uh, LinuxDelta.com, it has already been registered, and I have that that cryptographic uh, certificate. So you're going to have to come up with something else. Because of that, and it's not really a limitation, it's what you want if you're going to have secure messaging. But because of what I'm going to call for at the moment, that, that kind of limitation, it doesn't really allow for playing with Matrix. It doesn't allow you to set something up, play with it a little bit, tear it down. Set it back up, play with it, tear it down. Try something else, set it back up, tear it down. Uh, and so when I was first getting into Matrix and st first kind of playing with it and kind of learning on it and knocking on it and seeing how it all worked, I set up Matrix servers right and left. And I just never tied them to domains. I never put DNS. I never registered an SSL. And so I, I'd, I'd spin them up or I'd make something up, you know, you know, john.xyz or something like that. Uh, and it wasn't actually registering anything. It wasn't federating. It was just existing inside of my home land. So to do that, all you literally all you have to do is install Synapse and on a VM and you and your kids and your family could be up and running. Now, why do you want to register with a DNS? Why do you want to have SSL? Why do you want why do those things even exist? Well, those things exist because in order for it to be very secure, in order for it to be open and available on the wide open internet, um that's when you want to have all of those things in place. And then on top of that, if you ever want to take advantage of federation, that is to say, you want your server to be able to securely and effectively be able to communicate with other servers on the ma wider matrix ecosystem, then you don't have a choice. You have to have SSL. And I'm going to let our interactive matrix room jump in here. Uh, Sleuth, you had thoughts. Yeah, you mentioned almost everything I had to say, but matrix servers, like you said, don't require domains, don't require SSL. And if you disable the federation part, None of that's really required at all. You can, Synapse does kind of require a domain, but it doesn't actually need one. You can make one up on the internal LAN, and then you can reference it by that, mm. especially if you have your own DNS set up internally, which you could set up through TailScale as well. So then you could still have that nice, friendly domain experience to your users. You know, There's automated scripts for testing various matrix components that'll just stand it up in Docker for you. Um, I can maybe try to find a link to one of those if you want. They're not really meant for full deployments, but I, you could modify it to do that if you're familiar with it. Yeah, there's the Docker ones. There's also uh, Ansible Deploy, uh, Matrix Ansible Deploy, which is is pretty popular out there. When my when I was first getting my kids onto Matrix, when I was having them play with it, uh, we set up a Matrix server together. So I, we sat down at the kitchen table, and I said, here, we're going to set this up. And the idea there was they learned... Hey, my son locked himself out of his first account, right? But he learned that on a dumb dem de on a dumb demo instance. It wasn't on a, a live production thing, and so you know, getting kind of the concept of oh, here's what you know your uh, your uh, your recovery phrase, your passphrase. Here's how that works. Here's how to invite people to rooms. Here's how to set settings. What happens if you're an admin in a room and everybody leaves the room? And can you get back in? You figure all of that out on these dumb little made up setups. Uh, works great and then you can go into an actual production thing so i would tell you even if you wound up on something else down the road uh anthony i, I might tell you start here and because you're running an ES esxi hypervisor it's literally a couple of clicks to spin up uh a, a you know a centos box or, a, or or an ubuntu vm and then install synapse and just play with it and see what you think and if nothing else it'll be a fun project for you and your kids it, i should ask anything else to add from the matrix room uh, not that I'm aware of, other than make sure you set up a dedicated Postgres SQL server instead of using SQL Lite. Mm. You will definitely want to do that, no matter your deployment size. It's y worth the time. Yeah, the yeah, I agree with that. Even four or five users, um, once you start to get enough room history, it uh, it starts to bog down pretty quick. Absolutely.
Our pick of the week this week is Wall Cal. You can have your calendar appear as your wallpaper. We'll have the link to the GitHub available. So this is kind of cool. I... I have worked in a number of environments where they have either scripts or software that makes the wallpaper display things like the host name and the IP address and certain information so you can walk into a lab and figure out exactly what PC you're sitting in front of. Well, this project from Casper, Casper Tool uh, allows you to display your calendar as your wallpaper. And so it includes things like a timetable, a list of important events that have been taken from your calendar for the following seven days. It even includes a to-do list. And then you have the opportunity to scan every seven days, starting with the current day. And for the day's events, use the calendar file. A description for the syntax for the calendar events is described at the beginning of the file inside of the GitHub repository. So again, the project is called WallCal. I have a link for you in the show notes, podcast.asknoahshow.com. Source code is available up on GitHub. Our gadget of the week this week, it's kind of a twofer. You get a two-for-one special this week. So was coming across a post on Reddit, and it was talking about a guy who was, was encouraging people to email companies when these companies don't support Linux. So you purchase a product or you have a desire to use a given product or service, and that company says, well, we don't support Linux as an operating system. Okay, well, um, would you be willing to support Linux, or are you aware that there is somebody out there that wants to use your service or product, and we can't because we're on a different platform? And it turns out that the answer to that question is, yes, companies love hearing about that because oftentimes they are willing to forward that information to their software development department. And sometimes, as in the case of this guy cited, they are willing to come out and support Linux because of it. And so the first device that I want to talk about this week is a loop deck, L-O-U-P-E-D-E-C-K. And you can read, you can learn more at loopdeck.com. And what loop deck is, is an external USB uh, controller that basically allows you to do uh, scene switching. Um, it has a, a number of different knobs and buttons that allow you to assign uh, them to various macros and allows you to work with a software like Lightroom and Photoshop and, uh, and, and OBS and, and those kinds of things and, and even interface into things like Twitch. Now, what was interesting about this post, again, the post was because this company, Loop Deck, was willing to support Linux. And even though they didn't uh, outright advertise it on their site, when you emailed into the company and said, hey, would you do this? It turns out that they're actually working on it and we're willing to help this guy out. And so I made this post and I thought that was pretty cool. Where I, where you get the twofer is, in his post he said, well, I wanted to use a stream deck, but I, I didn't, I, in his words, it wasn't possible to use it with Linux. Well, I wanted to correct that because it is possible to use the Elgato Stream Deck with Linux. Um, so if you've not heard of the Elgato Stream Deck, the Elgato Stream Deck is a customizable controller. And so essentially it's, if you think of like an LCD screen with a bunch of buttons, physical buttons over the LCD screen, allowing you to customize um, what each button looks like. And these things are very popular because they the six key one starts at like 75 bucks and then you can get the 15 key one for like $150. And it comes with a little stand that sits and allows it to sit um, at an angle off of the desk. And out of the box, it's true, they don't make a driver per se that you just install in Linux and then plug the Steam uh, Stream Deck in and, and use it that way. However, there is a project called Companion, and uh, it's made by a company called BitFocus, and it's available, the source code is available on GitHub. Now, the tech director over at our church uh, took these to the extreme. One of the things that is very prevalent inside of, uh, inside of, of large venues is you rent that space out and when so people are coming in to use the space they want to be able to take advantage of all of the av audio stuff but they also don't necessarily have training in how to do that and you can't necessarily always have somebody on staff there to help you through that and so the commercial answer if somebody called ultimate technologies and said hey we need you to come in and do this the commercial answer to something like that is something like a crestron system very very robust system very very well done very, very high level of automation to the point that you walk up to the podium, you press, I want to present on a, on, on the projector and the Crestron system will automatically lower the, 
screen down, it'll automatically turn on the projector. If you push HDMI, you know, input laptop connection, it automatically turns the HDMI cable that's sitting at the podium on, as opposed to PC or DVD or whatever your other options are. It automatically dims the lights down. It automatically sends that video signal to all the TVs around the room. And all of that happens just with one button press. So let's say you're the tech director at, at my church and, and you're trying to, to do this. What he did was he went and basically rebuilt this, uh, a Crestron clone out of, uh, out of stream decks. And, uh, he uses the companion app to do that because once you tie it to the companion app, now you have the opportunity to tie it to all sorts of things. And so he tied it to the DMX lighting. He tied it to the in-house lighting. He tied it to the projectors and the amps and all the things. So you walk in and say, I want to start a church service. You push the button and the church fires up. And when you push the other button, the church powers back down. And that all happens with this $153 box tied to this companion software. But wait, no, I thought you set it right on Linux. I'm getting to that. So companion can run on a Raspberry Pi on Linux. And the advantage of doing that is you have this full-fledged remote control that can run all of these one-touch macros, presets, and all of the things, and it all can be contained inside of a tiny little unit. And so what people are doing is they're now going through and building these kinds of one-touch control systems, and they're mounting them into walls all based off the Stream Deck. And so Companion, I've not tried it on a, a, a desktop Linux device, but one can assume if you could run the code on a Raspberry Pi that it could fairly easily be modified since the code base is available on GitHub to run on a desktop computer. But even if it can't, the companion app, the way that it works, it's essentially a little web server that runs and you tie it to the various different pieces of, of automation that you want to use. And so uh, I wanted to correct the misnomer that you can't use a Stream Deck on Linux. You absolutely can. Now, Steve, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on this uh, for a couple of reasons. One is because they're, it's just a cool device. But the other thing is that I've always thought about doing with this is connecting Companion to Home Assistant and to have a physical interface to do things like set scenes in my house, turn lights on and off, those kinds of things. Is this something you would ever consider or is our buttons not the way you like to interact with your home? That is a great question. I've considered this. So um, the alternative that I have to this is there's little screens that you can get. They're like 25 bucks and you attach like a little $2 Wi-Fi chip to it. And if you are a little bit program savvy that you can, you can basically make that interface happen. And so that's kind of the route that I've went when I have screens because it basically allows you to have as many buttons as you want because you can have a button that says go to the next page and it can have as many pages as the device can actually handle before it runs out of memory. So I've done that once or twice, but I tend to prefer home automation as opposed to um, scripting, right? So if you go up and if you walk up and you push a button, then you're actually just scripting an event. Like you've moved the switch from the wall to whatever you're pushing. Whereas like when I walk into my office, the light, it checks the time of day, it turns the lights on, turns, it sends the wake on land packet to my computer, turns my monitors on, turns my fan on. Like that's, that's home automation. I don't have to do anything the the house reacts to me. And so the way that I try and tackle setting up my house is that it just reacts to you. It should be agnostic of the person. There should be no little to no um, learning curve, right? I should be able to pick up my in-laws who've never been here and they should be able to move around in the house without having to know, like, I need to push a button. Without magical incantations to get around the house. Exactly. AT Commander in the chat room points us to Stream Deck uh, UI. So this is uh, timothycrosley.github.io. And Stream Deck UI is a Linux-compatible UI for the Elgato Stream Deck. Um, so there is a software stack that you can run right on a Debian, Ubuntu, or Fedora box and configure your Stream Deck. So I guess it does work right on the... Now, again, this isn't officially supported by Elgato, so I don't want to get too carried away here, but the concept, the, the, the concept that you can't run an Elgato Stream Deck in Linux is, uh, is unilaterally false. Uh, categorically false. Um, there's plenty of different ways to do it, and I'm learning more all the time. I also want to get a small, tiny little plug in here for StreamPy. Uh, StreamPy, stream-pi.com, you can learn more. 
is a project has nothing to do with the stream uh, deck at all, except that they're trying to imitate it. And essentially they have replicated the concept of a stream deck with a touchscreen and a raspberry Pi. And so if you're on the budget side of things, you say, Hey, $153 for a little button thing. I can't afford that. Well, check out stream dash pi.com. Of course, links for everything we've mentioned. We'll have links for you in the show notes, podcast.asknoahshow.com. In the news this week, Ubuntu has extended its life cycle to 10 years. Quote, with the prolonged life cycle of Ubuntu 1404 and 1604, we're entering a new page in our commitment to enabling enterprise environments, said Nico, and I would butcher his last name if I even tried, but we'll have it for you in the show notes. Product manager at Canonical, each industry sector has its own deployment life cycle and adopts technology at a different pace. We're bringing an operating system lifecycle that lets organization manage their infrastructure on their own terms. While organizations have been putting significant effort and budget to phase out legacy systems, these efforts significantly increase the IT budgets over the last three years. By prolonging the operating system's life cycle to 10 years, Canonical enables organizations to better balance their IT budget in order to implement or plan their IT upgrade. So I'm, I'm curious, Steve, your thoughts on this. One of the things that has kept me back from Ubuntu for quite some time, if I'm honest with you, is the fact that with Red Hat, I just know I've got 10 years and I'm good to go. And with Ubuntu, their typical life cycle has been five years and then they, and then they try and iterate and they try and push you to the next thing. It seems like Canonical is looking over and saying, you know, maybe companies don't want to change as often as we thought they did or as often as we would like them to. I think it's interesting. I, I really like this move from Canonical. Um, it's a terrible thing for the desktop because there's going to be stagnation and all the rest of that. But as, as a server uh, platform, I think this is a good move. I also wonder whether there isn't a little bit of opportunism happening here where they're trying to jump in and take some of the, the CentOS space. And I don't mean that even disparaging, even a little bit disparagingly. I think they looked at it and said, there's a hole here that we have the opportunity to fill. And I think good on them for that. Um, I will have been a Linux advocate and, you know, Linux user. My first distro and longtime distro was Ubuntu. So I have no, even though I work for Red Hat, uh, I see this only as good. Like we're, we as a community have walked up and seen a gap and decided that this gap is going to be filled and Canonical kind of stepped up to to fill that gap for something that someone is looking for. I agree. I hadn't considered the desktop angle. That's that's a really good take. So one of the things that people struggle with, right, they bring home their new computer, they bring home that new graphics card, they bring home that new printer, they plug any one of those things in and all of a sudden, up. Oh, guess what? Operating system doesn't see it. Kernel doesn't support it. And now they're sat and going, Oh man, Linux didn't work for me, right? Well, no, actually, as it turns out, as soon as that printer, as soon as that graphics card, as soon as that wireless card was released, somebody out there opened a bug report, somebody else donated one, somebody worked on it, hacked on it, figured it out, submitted that code upstream, somebody reviewed that code, somebody pushed that code, somebody pushed a kernel update. All of that happened without anybody actually having to open their wallet up, likely, and pay any money. And so that problem is solved it just might take a few years before that trickles down to you. And what I heard you say is, man, it's it's going to be real frustrating for those people when that that take a while to trickle down to you goes from five years to 10 years. Yeah, I think a big part of this is the applications that you might use, like your browser and stuff like that, all of that is going to be fine in, in snaps. I mean, I, I personally haven't had a good experience with snaps in 14.04. It got way better at 16.04 and is, in my my opinion, where they wanted it to be in 18.04. So when you're talking about these these um, systems being mothballed, I think the concern is more for things like drivers, right? Where can you convince someone to make a driver that still works? You might be able to backport it and stuff like that. But I think as, as a whole, you're not going to see desktop improvements right unless unless canonical is able to move to you know desktop as a snap and i know there's some work going on in that area but in general those desktops are going to decay and feel primitive and you know not really keep up with the time so it's, it's i don't think it's a fantastic thing for the desktop 
but I mean, they they presumably have some sort of clientele that is driving this demand. Scuba Steve in the chat room says that most companies on aren't going to realistically wait 10 years between upgrades, but this is excellent PR and a faith move for the wider community as the enterprise. This system admin gives me more comfort knowing that Canonical is willing to back their product. That's kind of the way I see it too. Is it's, it's one of those things where I don't necessarily expect a server to sit in production for 10 years, but it's nice to know that we will want to cycle the server before we run out of life cycle in the operating system. Even if that means you have to pay extra to the company, even if that means that there is some, you know, uh, extended release agreement that you have to enter into. If the company is willing to back that product and is willing to support it, that's really what, that's really what, what would make me say, okay, I am comfortable putting that in production for the next 10 years. I'm going to open this up to our interactive matrix room. You can join us by going to geeklab.ninja there. You can participate. No account or creation is required. You can jump right into the chat room and participate with us. And then if you'd like to, you can create an account and join us in the interactive voice and video chat, which features both a pre and post show uh, around the show. Matrix room, welcome. Hey. How we doing? Uh, good. So this this announcement by uh, Canonical for uh, extending Ubuntu LTS, it's interesting because they essentially revived um, an LTS version that they'd actually previously mothballed. So Ubuntu 14.04 um, got revived for extended security maintenance with the ESM program. So this, this announcement essentially makes it so, for, for those who weren't already aware, Ubuntu 20.04 was already under the 10-year ESM program. What they just did was they took that same program and backported it to 16.04 and 14.04. Hmm. So 16.04, which was going to be EOL and ESM in two years, is now going to be ESM EOL in five. And 14.04, which had already expired in its ESM, it was revived again for a few more years. That That's basically what, what happened here. Um, I think this... While this will certainly make some businesses feel more comfortable with using Ubuntu in the enterprise, um, I think this will actually have net no impact on the wider community at large because the community doesn't get to benefit from this. This is only available for canonical paying customers using Ubuntu Advantage with the ESM contract, where you get uh, where you get paid updates that are not distributed freely. Um, to to be fair, you know Red Hat's ten year uh, support also is um, totally paid for. You have to have a support agreement with them to have access to those updates. Um, the difference between the Red Hat and the Ubuntu ecosystems at this point is there are RHEL rebuilds where you can get access to the binaries um, rebuilt that are available for you at the, you know, at the, with the um, same effect, basically, where you get security maintenance for 10 years with something like Alma Linux, for example. Um, so that's, I think, where the differences are. Um, from, a, from a press and marketing perspective, this is good on them for doing it. They're obviously seeing an opportunity. I agree with Steve that this is going to um, hurt the desktop part of Ubuntu quite a bit more. Um, than, I, I think actually the damage will be worse than, he, than, than, we, might have, than we might imagine, but we'll see. Um, from a server perspective, for... If if you're a business that's using community projects and community supported content on top of Ubuntu, this doesn't help you at all. This this probably will make your life worse because you will have to deal with the disparity between community support and and paid support for the same platform, and and that's going to not be very fun for anybody. So just playing devil, uh, I can speak from experience. Go ahead, Steve. I was just going to say I I think that. Um, it's going to depend, right? That it gives people kind of a uh, a parachute that they didn't have before. And there are, there are absolutely companies that I'm aware of running Ubuntu that would take that as opposed to, because even if they don't go the full 10 years to know that they've got an extra two years that they can kick this down the can, there are a bunch of companies that would, would totally pick that up. Um, oh, yeah, sure. I did have a general question though. So Red Hat, for example, the reason why rebuilds can happen is because when we do updates and patches, even for the extended maintenance and stuff like that, the source is released in the source RPMs and stuff like that. Does does Canonical do a similar thing? I, I actually don't no, know. No, they do not. They do not. Um, so I have used their ESM stuff before, and I, I have poked at their service because 
community folks using Ubuntu LTS can get access to ESM for free, um, for free machines, for personal use only, for non-commercial purposes. And I have poked at it, and no, you don't. Um, you're you're not you're not eligible for that for that kind of stuff. The sources are not publicly released. They're they're gated behind a contract, and you're not allowed to redistribute those sources. Um, so I would say that is a good. I, I would say that would be a good differentiator between Red Hat and and Canonical in this instance. You were saying like that you know they seem to be kind of equivalent from that perspective. I think I think this was a good way of. Red Hat really works hard to make sure the stuff that we do is open source. And even though some there's some aspects of the community that think that we just kind of toss things over the wall, um, I see it. I've been at Red Hat almost six years now, and I see how much effort goes into trying to make things open source from, from the things that we acquire to the projects that we undertake internally and how the people who are doing it really want to push this stuff to get and they want to... They want to open source it. And that's not to say that people at Canonical don't. I just mean it's in the DNA. So even like that's just something that I think Red Hat doesn't do a good job of expressing. Yeah, they don't. And Red, like I think it's also something that culturally is, is a little different between the two. Um, Red Hat is culturally very aligned to the expectation that they are an open source company. They make open source. They ship open source and nothing else. Even the things that most people would expect for them to be proprietary SaaS, the um, um, hybrid cloud console or whatever the Insights platform is called now, that's actually open source. It's on GitHub. You can go download the code and try to figure out how to deploy it. Um, but like all the code's there, all the instructions on how it's deployed is there. You're not going to be very successful deploying it because it's very complicated, but it's all there. And and that's that's a very big difference that I feel like Red Hat and and to a lesser extent Sousa just do not capitalize on and they do not promote properly to show how they mean what they say. So I I would just I want to wrap the discussion up by just saying, you know, one of the things that's nice about living in an open source world is the fact that, you know, if you're on a desktop operating system and you say to yourself, "Hey, I want the newer updates. Well, nobody's stopping you from going and downloading the latest version of Ubuntu and running it. And so to a certain degree, um, we can pick apart and we can break into detail, uh, nitpick all of the different ways that some of this stuff can and can't work. But at the end of the day, uh, the more options that are on the table, the more comfortable that businesses are going to be and the more co and the better off I think end users are going to be in general. And even if that means we divide across distros and say, well, you know, if you want the latest one version of things and the latest access to code, then go to something like Arch or Manjaro and you'll have access to that. And then when these companies need to sit down and, and, and slide into something completely stable, they have that opportunity both from Red Hat and Canonical even if it comes at the expense of an agreement. I think that's fantastic. So as I've mentioned a couple of times over the past few weeks, um, when we get a number of emails that come into us that ask either the same question over and over again or a series of questions that can all be categorized in the same general area, we try to make a segment out of that because our ultimate goal is to serve you, the listener. We try to earn your ears every single week. And so this week, we are talking about self-hosting. And this it's not that we've not covered it on the show before. It's not that we haven't done it justice. It's not that anybody that listens to the program probably isn't aware of what self-hosting is. But the landscape is constantly changing. And it's constantly evolving. And things are constantly changing. And Steve moved into a house, and he's going to self-host all of those things. So... We're going to give it another whack. Again, mostly driven by your emails. So I want to start the discussion off uh, talking about living on an island. When I was a kid, I'd get into a car, and before I left the house, I would make sure to load my laptop. I was a weird child. Everybody else was focused on Nintendos and Game Boys and stuff like that. I was like, I want a laptop computer. Uh, and, and so before I left the house, I would load up on floppy disks, all of the data that I wanted to take with me from my big tower at home and I'd load it onto my laptop as I get in the car and drive and because I wasn't going to have any access to my home computer and PC anywhere only worked if I had an active phone line and I couldn't necessarily count on that. And so my entire adult life, I've always kind of lived my life uh, 
kind of not connected to the internet. It's always been kind of the superfluous thing that allows me to get to the internet. And so when the internet goes out, still watch my media, can still stream volume, all those things still work. And I wanted to talk a little bit with you, Steve, about this, because I know you uh, run your house very much the same way, except you've added a twist because you've automated almost everything in your home, but you've done so in a way that the internet doesn't take you out at the knees. Tell me a little bit about that. So part of this came up because uh, there was a, a viewer or a listener that that wrote in talking about how they came across Home Assistant and they equate, let's say, home automation coordination with Internet of Things devices. And so I wanted to kind of address this um, on the air because I thought there I get this misnomer quite a bit. So my house so yesterday this this was the kind of crowning jewel for us yesterday the the internet was out from about 5 a.m to i want to say noon and aside from the fact that we couldn't open up a web browser nobody knew like until i told my wife hey it's 8 a.m and i still don't have the internet she had no idea walk around the house the lights are coming on you know automations are firing you know she's watching her show on plex the kids are getting ready for school all that kind of stuff and so um, I have taken great pains to make sure that the things that I deploy here have one of two things. They're either locally controlled only or they run open source software. So uh, I, try to, I try to lean towards the open source software, but sometimes it's not practical depending on, you know, if there's a product that, that is required by code to have, you know, so much amperage or this type of certification. Uh, the open source software may not run on that. And so then I will move to something like a protocol like Z-Wave where it's, you know, local. And so it's it's near and dear to my heart that I'm spending a decent amount of money to make sure that Plex works, that our lights work, that, you know, my wife can get at her recipes and, and all of that sort of stuff just works without even realizing that the internet's down. That's... Uh... Uh, to me, that is the gold bar of self-hosting, right? And so when you write in or when you think about looking at self-hosting, that would be what I would consider to be the gold bar is if the internet goes away, you don't even notice much less care because the internet is just a superfluous thing. It's just the ability to go out and do these other things. Now, it's not to say that we can live without it, right? It's, I mean, you didn't go to work until the internet came back up, right? So, I mean, there's some of that that comes into play. But it's not the earth coming to a halt, which I see literally on a weekly basis. There's some business that we are a part of and that we get a phone call. This happens once a week uh, where somebody says, hey, we lost Internet or they cut a fiber line or we lost power. And, and, and everything has just gone down the tubes because they couldn't get to the Internet. And uh, the more we have clients that have door control systems, access control systems that are tied to the cloud. And so they can't get into their buildings if they don't have internet. And that's absurd to me. Um, so Steve and I sat down and said, okay, in light of wanting to live on the Island, if you were going to the self-hosting Island and the only, you didn't have access to the internet. So the only things that you were going to have were the things that you were willing to set up, maintain and use. What would those things be? So we got kind of a short list together here. Um, Ones that Steve and I agreed on right away, Libvert. Um, I'm also going to throw a mention out there for Proxmox because a lot of people out there say, oh, you don't give enough attention to Proxmox. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good tool. I like it. Um, PFSense or it's, uh, open, it's more open source equivalent, I guess I should say. OpenSense is great something to play with. Uh, Plex or Jellyfin for streaming uh, media. I use Kodi just tied right to my TrueNAS. If you're looking for file server, TrueNAS or uh, open media vault. I also use C file to sync those files around uh, next cloud open VPN. So you can get to your files remotely or WireGuard. Uh, volumeo for hosting your audio inside of your house. And so you can listen to that throughout the house, some sort of a wiki. Steve is currently using confluence. I'm using media wiki. Um, I was talking to him a little bit before the show. We're thinking X wiki might be the way to go in the near future. Pie hole for DNS requests. And of course, I'm going to throw a, a pitch in there for Element because I think everyone should have an Element server. Steve, would you modify that list at all? Not really. I would put Cody further up the list because mm. I'm I'm a huge, huge proponent of Cody. The only reason why we have Plex is for 
the mobile devices, right? My wife always has her phone on her, so Plex is super handy for that. But aside from that, we run uh, we run Cody and love it. Like I actually, I think I told you the story about how I parked my Apple TV. It's sitting on my shelf, and I went back <laughs> to my Android TV because or my uh, Nvidia Shield because it has Cody on it. I just I just could not not have Cody. Yeah, I'm 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 a big fan of Cody as well. A, a, a tiny in the or I'm sorry, sleuth in the chat room put Funk Whale for music streaming. So we'll add that. Calibra gets thrown in there. Uh, and yeah, Cody, if you're looking for if you're looking for the ability to have a VCR DVR equivalent um, where you just have a dedicated box and all that's required for that to work, there is no server component to Cody. It just literally reads files off of a NAS. And Cody's definitely the way to go. But hey, you know what? We've probably left some things off on the list that you think should be on the list. So get over to your computer. Send us an email live at asknoahshow.com. Tell Steve and I what we missed. What do you have to have in your home running as a self-hosted service? Steve, pleasure as always. They can find you on Twitter at Linux Ovens. They can find me at Colonel Linux. You can follow the show at Ask Noah Show. The music in my ears means we're out of time, but we continue next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central, asknoahshow.com. Have a good week. Have a good week.